Hi, and welcome to another episode of Get Your Fill, Financial Independence and Long Life, where we explore ways to achieve those two goals. And we invite people on to help us who are going to tell us how they went from everything to nothing to everything again in such a short time. Jerry Feta is a really cool guy, and he's been able to take advantage of um, listening to his own sauce or eating his own sauce or whatever that is. He helps make finances simple, true, and applicable. He's the founder and CEO of Wealth Dynamics, a financial firm that helps thousands of clients around the U.S. to build wealth. He has a passion for providing financial education for families so they can become solvent and achieve, and achieve greater financial freedom in life. He's married to his wife and business partner, Lexi, and together they've achieved financial independence in their own lives before the age of 30. Oh man, I feel like a total loser. And they want to help as many families as they can to do the same. Jerry, thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, Christine, thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to, uh, to speak with your audience and it's a real privilege. So before we get started, I mean, like, I'm just going to throw away anything I was going to ask you because what you just told me before we started the recording is really intriguing. So tell me what happened with, with, um, tell me about the, the, um, the fraud that happened, the, the bad shit that happened to you last year. Yeah. Yeah. We all have some bad shit here and there. Right. So mine, <laughs> mine was pretty, uh, pretty deep, wide and interesting colors, I would say. Right. So um, yeah, I, I'm 30 years old and I, I built, um, you know, from the age of 18, I got into financial services and, and I just continued building and growing my business and doing the right things. And so by the age of 30, I built a multi-million dollar per year company. Uh, I was, you know, this close from being financially independent where the passive income from my investments covered my savings expenses and taxes. Uh, everything seemed to be going very well. Uh, and in August of last year, I received an email saying a, a major investment that I had money and committed fraud. Um, and so what had happened? Yeah, pretty crazy. Um, the, the the owner of that fund was actually my childhood best friend. I knew him since seventh grade. Oh um, you know, I, I did all of the due diligence and everything. And so ultimately what ended up happening is he was losing money in the funds, uh, reporting positive profits to us on our statements and then collecting money from new investors to pay off the old investors so that we didn't feel like anything was going on. Right. So, um, you know, when that happened, you know, the result of that was another another uh, separate fund I was investing in actually, unbeknownst to me, was also invested in this first fund. So um, two of the places I had a, a majority of my net worth, you know, immediately dropped, gone. Uh, and you can imagine the impact that that then had on my personal finances, my business, um, I actually, I actually did end up getting, you know, a divorce through that as well. Um, oh, no. there's a very crazy time for me as an entrepreneur. And that's, wow. that's kind of my story is I think, you know, we, we see on social media, a lot of the highlights of the good stuff and the successes. Sure. And, um, my story is maybe a bit more exaggerated, but I think we've all got a story like this, you know, being, I call it being in the arena where, you know, we're going through the barriers and the failures. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hey, I'm sorry that all that happened to you, man. That stinks. But yeah, then you get to test it, right? Then you get to say, hey, I wonder if all this stuff I've been teaching other people really works. <laughs> For sure. And I think that's the difference between, you know, being a victim and being a victor. A victim, uh, you know, in that scenario, like having been there myself, it's very easy to look for whose fault it was and how can I blame someone else and sure. why me and all of these different things that really they don't help. They don't, you know, they don't fix what's happening. So, you know, being a victor, you, you assume responsibility. What did I do to cause it? Even though, you know, I felt like I had done everything, the person running the fund, I'd known him since seventh grade. I checked out the, you know, the, the, you know, filings with the government to make sure he was, you know, actually registered as a fund. I did all of the things you're supposed to do and it still turned out wrong. Yeah. Right. And, and so for me, that really was a time of, um, you know, kind of, kind of testing my own gut. Like, you know, I, there's a lot of rebuilding and patching things back up, but assuming the responsibility and saying, okay, cool. I did this once and who I am now versus when I was 18, when I started, um, Christine, I, I have a lot more knowledge, intelligence, skills, ability, just life experience. And so on the rebuild side of it, it's actually more exciting. It's more fun. You know, I'm a much better, a much better entrepreneur than I was back then. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because everybody who I've ever talked to who has achieved that level, they, you know, they say the same thing because it's mindset, right? So it, you could strip me down, put me in the middle of the desert with absolutely no assets. And in another year, I would be right back to where I am today because 
Now I understand how it works. Now I believe that I deserve to have these things, now, right? So it just all becomes, and it's a testament to that and, and a test, a test and a testament of the, the, the role or the power of mindset. It is. It's such a big thing. And I think a lot of people, you know, the entrepreneurs and, and just ordinary families and individuals alike, you know, we're kind of coming out of this season where we had a pandemic a couple of years ago, crazy stuff going on with the economy. And I think a lot of us have had these little failures, you know, things that we weren't expecting to have happen that happened that maybe it impacted our business or it impacted our family or whatever it might be. Uh, and so for me, it's really been great being able to share the story of like, Hey, I went, I went through hell in the last, you know, year or so. Um, I think all of us can experience and relate to that in some way. And like you said, the mindset thing, yeah. right. It all starts up here. And, and those are the types of moments and times where it really can bring someone down to a level that they don't feel like getting back up from. Uh, and, and I think that's part of, you know, the resilience of the human spirit and also just the game of being an entrepreneur is you, you've got to be able to take the punches. <laughs> and the risks, right? I mean, there's a risk just to not having somebody handing you a paycheck, whether you're smart or dumb or whether, you know, whether you show up or not, or whether you give your all or not, you don't get to coast like that when you're an entrepreneur. For sure. Yeah. You have to create it. And, and, um, you know, I think early on for me as an entrepreneur, that was a, a little bit scary. I was used to having a paycheck, you know, I was used to having a boss, a job. And so, you know, when I first started my business, you know, I remember making, you know, what I thought was a lot of money in the first month or two and actually quit my job. I was like, if this is, if this is entrepreneurship, I don't need to work anymore. Uh, <laughs> and I made, I made no money the next several months and actually had to go back to the job and build it back up again. So I'm, I'm not unfamiliar with this, you know, you think you're at the top and then it turns out you got to go back down and do some more work. And I think that's part of like the, you know, the difference between an entrepreneur and someone who, you know, is, you know, maybe they're just looking to have a, a you know, easy paycheck, or if you're an investor and you're looking to just have assets paying you nothing wrong with those, but the entrepreneur wants the game. They want the excitement. They want the ingenuity. They want the risk. They want the fear. They want the wins. They want the whole experience. Uh, and it might not seem normal to others, but it's, it's hard to explain it. You know, exactly what I mean, where you just crave, you crave the excitement. Oh, exactly. There's nothing worse to me than the idea of just like, playing golf or something for the rest of my life. Like what is retirement? I mean, you know, I'm going to be 60 in July and I'm like, I'm already retired. And people are like you work, you know, you're, what do you mean? You're always doing this and that and the other thing. And you have 15 companies like, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing that I learned about this word retirement. So I, I grew up, you know, kind of in what I would call the traditional financial advising industry, helping people with that. How do we set up your 401k so you can retire at age 65 and, right. You know, how do we make sure you paid off the house and you've done all this, you know, setting up your nest egg. And there's really three big moments for me that changed that, Christine. And one of the big ones was when I was 21 years old. I was my mom's financial advisor. Uh, she was one of my very first clients. Uh, and she actually died from cancer at age 60. Oh, um, sorry. The year, and that was the year, right? You're, you're allowed to at 59 and a half, start taking retirement distributions. And so we're looking at her account statements, you know, all this stuff, anticipating that. And she got diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Um, and six months later, she was gone. And, and so I watched as a 21 year old financial advisor, you know, the quote unquote system, uh, not working with one of the people that I loved the most in my life at that point. And that was a real gut check for me on is this really what I want to do myself? Yeah. And is it really what I want to be teaching other people to do? Yeah. Um, and, and interestingly enough, this word retire, I'm big on roots, like where did the word come from? What's the etymology of it? Yeah. Uh, it actually means retreat. Retire means to retreat. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to spend 40 years building advance, a life? Advance, advance, advance. <laughs> yeah, like we want to continue making progress, not get to this pinnacle of, okay, I can't handle this anymore. Let me go do nothing on the beach. Uh, and the other thing too, is when people do retire, they typically, statistically, they die younger. Um, yeah. Alzheimer's kicks in, dementia, disease illnesses, yeah. and there's a higher risk for that versus someone that has a reason to wake up every day. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, retirement is fine if you're going to live to be 65, right? But if you, my my aunt lived to 105, right? I'm going to retire at 65 and sit around for 40 years. I mean, come on, you just mm -hmm. that just can't be a thing. Like she used to do, she she painted and did puzzles and stuff. But I, I'd shoot myself before long, you know. Yeah, I get bored quick too. Yeah, yeah. And, and the game kind of becomes die before the money runs out. 
yeah. right? Like that's kind of a morbid way of, of looking at it, but that's really what's happening is I'm hoping that I don't outlive my retirement because right. I'm really screwed if that happens. So <laughs> right. this yeah. is my retirement plan. I'm going to die young. Okay, good. That's a, <laughs> sounds like a lots great of money time. left over that I didn't get to use. Right. Exactly. And leave 59 cents to my ancestors. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of my view on it, but really, you know, what I, what I would like to talk about too today is like kind of the process of, you know, rebuilding and building. Um, yeah. And, and that was, that was my view really, Christine, initially is I was like, okay, I have to, re- I have to rebuild now. You know, I went from a multi-million dollar net worth, uh, you know, down to just having, you know, reserves enough to run my company and some basics and things to stay afloat. Yeah. And so I, I was kind of struggling with like, you know, I have to now rebuild, I have to go redo all the work. And for me, I guess what I noticed and realized with that is that there are certain things you just do, right? So for example, you eat every day because you should, right? It's what's needed. We sleep every day because that's what's needed. And so we don't call that re-eating and re-sleeping. We just call it <laughs> eating and sleeping. And so I realized for myself, it's not rebuilding. It's just building. I'm, I'm, I'm at this position and now I'm building. And I was building the whole time. And I think that's a message that for especially a young entrepreneur, the building never really stops. It's not a, it's not a finish line of like, when am I done? You know, if we're really committed to the entrepreneurial game, it's, it's always going to be another idea. It's always going to be another company. Um, You mentioned you have 15 or so of those and you're probably constantly thinking of more, right? There's no finish line, right? (laughs) Yeah. You're just always going to build. And I had to, I had to face that and be like, okay, that's right. I'm, I'm all with the, whether I'm restarting this company or I'm starting a new one from zero, Exactly. It doesn't matter. It's it's building and that's what's always going to be there. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you go about it? I mean, because it's similar to what somebody might do if they're at zero today and they say, okay, yeah. I have this, right? I have X amount. Maybe I have $10,000 in my savings or in my mm. retirement account or something. So I want to be in the next 10 years. I want to be someplace where I don't have to work for someone else, where I don't have to. And that's even a whole question is, do you think you can become financially independent working for somebody else, but we'll save that question until after. So let's say that you're, you are working for someone else. You've got a little bit of financial stability. You don't have a ton of money. You have some maybe entrepreneurial ambitions. What, what's sort of step one? Where do you, where do you sort of, how do you figure out where you're at first of all? Yeah. So, so for me, I had to kind of look at, you know, an inventory of like, you know, I had an existing company staff payroll, like none of that stuff went away. So my, my assets and net worth did, but the, the bearings of the business were still there. So, um, you know, I kind of liked that when I first became an entrepreneur, I started very slow, right. I, I kind of put my foot in the water and I did a lot of reading and studying and organizing and different things. Uh, and there's a time and a place for that, but when you're brand new, just get out there and start promoting and selling, right? Like if you look at a guy like Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, for example, he had the the adage of like always send it to market first. We can always, you know, debug the product and fix it. They were big on pre-selling and marketing. Yeah. So really, like that has to be it. Is you've got to promote, you know, what you're doing and what your idea is. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the starting point. Is is like you know figuring out where I'm at financially. Like if you're at a job right now, you know if if you're doing something that's new, you might have the job and the business for a little bit, right? You might need to be able to build that bridge to where you can finally jump across and and do that in a way that's, you know, manageable and easy for you to to make a transition. Um, You know, when I first began, I was kind of doing that model, right? I I, I had an easy job. I was a pizza delivery driver in the evenings. It was something that didn't take a lot of my time and attention. And I knew I could clock in, clock out. I could listen to audios and, and books and stuff while I drove. Yeah. And then in my other time, I would run my business. And I finally got to a point where I saw other people winning and I knew I was smarter and I knew I was more able and it didn't make sense. So I finally cut the cord on the pizza job early and put myself in a position where I had no choice but to go perform. Um, and I really think that that depends on the kind of person and individual is. We've all got different personality styles. So I think that's part of that review process is figuring out, is this a gradual thing or do I need to just burn the ships? Yeah. Right. And I've always been a burn the ships kind of guy. Um, and, and then part of that is immediately taking that idea to market, you know, talking to people, promoting. Um, you know, I think I think there's something to be said for good salesmanship. Like that's like for me recently, when all of this happened, that was one of the first things I did is I was like, OK, I need to I need to make a list and start making calls. And even though I have a sales team, great, if they put deals on the table, that's awesome. But I need to take control of of what's happening and do that myself. 
Yeah. Um, and, and that really is, you know, the idea of I need to figure out like, what is it that I'm delivering and make sure it's wanted and needed by a group of people. And then I need to figure out who is that group of people and who are those individuals and how do I get in contact with them so that I can let them know that I have something that they do want and need. Uh, and I think so many of us, we get stuck on that part because it's the uncomfortable part, you know, promoting ourselves, talking to strangers, asking people for business, trying to get money, trying to, you know, close a sale where someone might be wanting to object, object or think about it. I think that's really the guerrilla kind of warfare side of building a business from the ground up, especially if I don't have a bunch of capital and I don't have investments, I've got to be able to create the income to do that and infuse that cash into my own growth. Yeah. And well, and that gets back to what you were saying about taking things to market early, because then you get that feedback and you understand maybe there's a different way to explain this to people, or maybe your market isn't who you thought your market was, or maybe you mm -hmm. need to tweak something. I mean, if you just wait till everything's finished and you build the thing that you think everybody wants, then you've mm -hmm. wasted a lot of time when, you know, when you find out that that's not exactly what they want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really like it helps you, you know, also dialing in the delivery process too. Um, you know, the, the confusion that most business owners and entrepreneurs have is they think that sales equals income when really no sales might be the starting point, but delivery equals income, right? Someone paid me for, let's say I own a McDonald's franchise, a burger. Cool. I collected $5, but if I don't deliver that burger, I'm not going to have $5 for long. Yeah. And if it's not a good, a good burger, I'm not going to have the $5 happen again. Right. So that early sales process and marketing allows you to refine your process um, you know, so that your delivery can be quick and it can be something that's easy for people to get to. And it's a great experience. And that way your business can scale and have that longevity. So I really took the opportunity myself as part of that to, to look at those things, right? Where do we need to reorganize processes in the business? You know, yeah. where, especially when there's a bit of an emergency situation happening, like you want to make sure that, that the areas that are running are really smooth, right? You can't have those become liabilities also. So yeah. You know, those are little things as an entrepreneur, if I'm just starting out, I'm marketing, I'm selling, and I'm probably doing that with people that already know, like, and trust me, right? A, a big mistake I, I made early on, and I've seen other people make is that, you know, social media and online branding is definitely an important piece of a business, but that's a long game, right? So most of the people on social media, they don't even know me yet. So to think I'm going to take a complete stranger and turn that into a customer, unless I'm really doing well with ad spend and targeting, and if I'm brand new, I'm not, right. then, you know, I need to develop the no like, and trust factor long-term knowing that in the next two, three years, that's going to pay off big. But in the short term, it's about who do, who do I currently have that I can go talk to and developing kind of that old, you know, that old networking type of sales and marketing where you'd go to groups and you'd meet people and you'd sit down with them and you'd hear here, we might do a zoom call instead, but you know, it's a face-to-face -face type of build. It's true. You know, I'm, I just, one of my, <laughs> one of my hats right now, I just bought a building and I'm turning it into a co-working space and we had the big grand opening and I did, you know, I did social media ads and I did print ads. And yet when we had the actual grand opening, every single person who walked through that door, I knew them. It was all yeah. people I had met through networking. And mm -hmm. of course, you know, family and friends, but everybody who wasn't related to me, I had met through networking. And that was what really, because then, right, you've already, they already are curious about you. They already give a crap about you. They're already know, like, and trust you. So you've got that advantage. It's, there's no, I don't think there's, no matter what your business, I don't think there's a substitute for that face-to-face -face marketing, or like you say, no. Zoom to Zoom <laughs> marketing. And do you think, do you think that that's kind of becoming a lost art? Like, it seems like that's not, like having a conversation with someone is not something that, you know, people are as comfortable doing as they might've been 10, 15 years ago. Like it, to me, it seems like kind of, you have that you're, you're a diamond in the rough. You've got an advantage. It's true. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I'm, I'm, I have a, you know, I'm part of, as, as I'm sure you are, you know, part of some mastermind groups and, and groups of other entrepreneurs. And some of them have found great success because they're selling something that you can see. So they'll, you know, put a picture on Instagram and then people are ordering it and they're just like, oh, wow. You know, it's so easy. I just put a picture on and people are ordering it. But then when it comes to talking to for example, someone who you could sell to wholesale or someone who might want to invest in your business, they just don't even know what to say to them. When in mm -hmm. fact, you right, they do have the passion. They do love the product. They do believe in the product, but there's the idea of like talking to other humans. It's like, mm, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's just like, what? Just yeah. tell them I've got this great stuff and you need it, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. 
It um it kind of reminds me of you know like the the old kind of the 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 story of you know the the guy that's in high school or middle school and he's got a crush on the girl and he's afraid to go talk to her right. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that a little bit where it's like, what do I say when I'm in front of my customer? What do right. I say when I'm in front of, you know, possibly an investor or an important relationship? Right. And, I, and I think that that's the part that, you know, you've got to skin your knees up a little bit and just go make it happen. And kind of a word of encouragement to listeners is most of those people have been where you're at before. Oh yeah. Like for me, when I get approached by someone and I can tell they're going out on a limb and they're, they're trying to do something for their business. I actually admire that. Like I'm, yeah. I'm more willing because I'm like, yeah, I've been there. I, I I understand and I'm willing to help. And, you know, maybe I'll do business with you. Maybe I won't, but I'm willing to hear you out. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the people on the receiving end are, are willing to as well. And maybe not just hear them out, maybe even give them a piece of advice that could be right. Career changing. Yeah. You could, you could possibly say something that that person, you know, you may say, well, if you would have said this, or I don't know, whatever, you might just give them one little pearl of wisdom that could spark an idea or whatever. And it could be, it's definitely worth it, right? You're not necessarily going to walk away with a paycheck, but you could definitely, it's going to benefit you just having a conversation with someone who is, who is where you want to be. Absolutely. And, and I, so that's, that's kind of like, you know, when I, when I started rebuilding things, what I went back to, um, and, and so we spend a lot of time having those conversations with current clients, current customers. How do we make the experience better? How do we refine things? Yeah. And then on the other hand, we, we were doing a lot of promotion and advertising and reaching out to new people as well so that we keep that flow of new people coming in, being satisfied, coming back for more, servicing them, new people coming in. Yeah. Uh, and, and that really was like probably for me, one of the game changers, um, Christine, in the last year or so was my executive team and I sat down and we really looked at like, if you think of it like a conveyor belt, like what is the particle flow of the business from this right. point to this point to this point to this point? And do we really have that planned out? And are we being intentional with that so that we can predict like what's next? How long should this step take? How do we put in quality control to make sure if it's not happening the way it's supposed to, we get it fixed quickly? Like, uh, like I recently saw the movie again, The Founder. Have you seen that one? It's the McDonald's story. No, I haven't seen that yet. I don't know why I haven't seen that. I've got to watch Phenomenal that. Phenomenal movie. Phenomenal movie. It's Michael Keaton and um, they the, the the McDonald's brothers, not Ray Kroc, but the McDonald's brothers, they're process obsessed. So they're very, very focused on like how smooth it is in the kitchen and how what, what temperature should the fries be at and how long should the burger be there before it's flipped. Yeah. And that really is like a well-oiled machine. Yeah. And that's for me, like when I look at rebuilding, right? Like that's the part I'm excited about because I know how to scale. Back then, I didn't know how to scale. Right? I'm mm -hmm. thinking about how do I just build it for the first time and establish it. And there's some duct tape and some zip ties right. holding it together. <laughs> but I, I, you know, the a mentor of mine, you know, several years back, he asked me, "When you're scaling, the first question is, what is it that you're scaling, and is it worth being scaled? Yeah. Right? If you've got a broken system, why are you trying to scale a broken system? You're just going to scale chaos. Yeah. So, you know, like that first phase, and 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 you know, even for me now is still, you know, keep the lights on, sell, market, grow, all of the things that make the entrepreneur, you know, in business long enough to build one. And that is the bootstrapping. And I call it coping. Like you kind of do have to just keep your head above water and do all the things you've got to do for a, for a period of time. And then in the background, you've got to be doing the organizing and, and getting it to a point where it can sustain and you can build. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, is that, and if you want to ever be able to to really grow, to give someone else, like for example, like a franchise is, an opera, is, is a great example, right? McDonald's works because every single McDonald's tastes the same. I don't care mm -hmm. if you're in the Soviet Union or if you're in Utah or if you're in you know Florida, you're getting the exact same consistent product. So mm -hmm. you can't do that, right? You can't scale in that way unless you can teach other people to do, as long as you have to have your hands in it, you really can only get so big. Yeah. And those yeah, and, processes and are that right are the tool to do that. Yeah, the processes and 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 the funny thing about that is McDonald's doesn't even have the best product. Right. That's that's, <laughs> that's that not right? a good number. <laughs> like, but it's consistent. It's consistent and apparently it's wanted and needed and the process creates that consistency. Um I had a mentor when I was 18, 19 years old and and he would tell me Christine, he would say, "Jerry, the system runs the business and the people run the system." And so you've got to have the system first. And that's like the primary thing. And it, obviously that's what makes the consistency and product and experience. And the next thing is plugging in the people. 
Um, and that's that's a whole nother game of of you know recruiting and and getting people bought in on your mission and finding people that are talented and want opportunity. Um, and that was a learning curve too. Like for me in my world, like I had to really look at, you know, when I lost everything and went back down to the ground on on building my business and my net worth, I had to really look at do I have the right people on my team? Right. And and not to make any of the current people that were on my team wrong, but I had to look at okay, I'm 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 obviously there was a blind spot and I didn't see the blind spot, which is my flunk, but also I didn't have anything, anyone in my life that pointed it out to me. Yeah. And so in hindsight, those are those are really tough questions and conversations and kind of things to, to look at as an entrepreneur. But the people we surround ourselves are such a big impact on, you know, what we notice, what we don't notice, who says what. And as a CEO, like I really want people to have the the balls to come tell me there's a problem. Like I don't want to be yes man. I don't want to have someone just saying what they think I want to hear. Uh, and so I realized I didn't have a lot of people in those like that in my life at that time that would have been like, hey, like I know you love this over here, but it doesn't look good, right? This is broken. This is why we need to go fix it. Um, and I think that people that have that candidness and and that you know that honesty and are willing to help even if it's not the you know, the thing we're interested in hearing, and it might not be the most exciting news in the world, that's the kind of people that you want around you, especially as you're growing, because they care enough to say something. But it's not just that, Jerry, right? Sometimes those people drive you nuts. You know, you're, we're, I'm an entrepreneur. I, those analytic people, I just want to tell them, just shut up, you know? Okay. Yeah. Well, the money's going to come. Don't worry about it. Don't be looking at the numbers and, you know, but you have to have someone like that or else you're just going to work yourself and, you know, drive yourself into the ground. So you've got to yeah. have somebody who's going to be that anal retentive person who, you know, you're going to like hate, you know, when you see their name come up on your phone and be like, oh God, what do they want now? But you have yeah. to have them. <laughs> there's, there's an old quote from Teddy Roosevelt that I love. Um, and I, my, my book that I wrote, I, I wrote a book on, on my whole experience on this is called man in the arena. It's actually based on that, that speech from Teddy Roosevelt, but he's got a quote that says, um, complaining about a problem without bringing up an immediate solution is just whining. And so for me, that's always been the way to tell, like when someone's like that, if they're saying, Hey, Christine, I'm concerned about this. I've got attention on this. And here's what I think we should do about it. I love that. Like do that all day long. It might be annoying. I might be like, Oh, not again, but they're, they're helping. They're contributing yeah. versus the person that's just like, Hey, Christine, here's a problem. And there's no solution. There's like, here's a problem. And I'm like, dude, I have a, you realize I have I enough have of those. 15 staff, 2000 clients. We're in all the, I don't need another problem. Like take care of the problem for me, please. I don't want to know about it. Exactly. It's true. Yeah. And that's the bigger your organization gets, right? The easier it is to kind of find that people are creeping in there who have, who want to, you know, basically have, you know, stir the pot, bring up a little drama, maybe like, oh, so-and-so said such and such. And you're just like, yeah, you need to leave. <laughs> yeah, I, I call that putting pikes on heads. It's like the, the old in the villages with the savages right. when the neighboring neighboring tribe attacks, you put a couple of heads on the pikes and you hang them up by the gate and people know, okay, let's yeah. not do that again. I don't no. want to be one of those. Exactly. Don't come here with that. Yeah. I'm not the spot for it. Awesome. So, you know, you brought up a couple of times and I just want to touch on it because I just think it's unbelievable that you got started at this 18. Now, I don't even want to tell you what a complete loser I was at 18, but, and I don't think I was alone in that. So did something happen like as a young person that really made you want to focus on the financial end or did you just born as like an overachiever or tell me how, how this happened so young? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've, I've always been odd. Like, uh, like I've just, you know, kind of been a strange, you know, in the sense that I'm, I'm unusual. <laughs> like I, I care about things that most people didn't care about. A good example is when I was 17 years old. Um, so just kind of mock this up. I'm a, I'm a guy, I'm in high school, you know, I'm a junior or senior, my older brother, and he's probably like 19 at the time in passing. He tells me that the U S dollar is not backed by gold, right? To the average 17 year old, that doesn't mean shit. They don't care. There's girls, this weekend is coming up. Right. There's the sporting event. I was very focused on that. I was like, what what is the meaning of life then? Like if the dollar's <laughs> monopoly money, why would I go work for money and try and accumulate it? So I actually at 17 made the decision to quit on, on money, ironically enough. I was like, I'm not going to go work for something that's backed by nothing. Right. So I kind of always had those kind of like, you know, just little things that most people wouldn't care about really meant something to me. But 
Um, you know, I grew up in, in poverty, um, you know, as a kid, when I was eight years old, all in the same summer, my, my mom and dad got their house taken away. Uh, the car got repoed. They got divorced. I was homeless, actually, on both sides of the family. We were living in a tent in the woods at, uh, over at my dad's house. We we're living in a, a un, unfurnished, no heat, no water trailer behind someone else's house at my mom's house. Oh, so I kind of had this, like, I guess living at the bottom, right? I was a food bank kid. I remember drinking, you know, sour milk and having to eat the moldy bread and being told penicillin is good for you. And, <laughs> you know, watching a bug I remember crawl that through too, my cereal. I, <laughs> I remember eating raisin bran and like a bug crawl through my cereal. I was like, that's definitely not a raisin. And, and being told, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Eat the cereal anyways. We don't have anything else. So I never had like, I guess means or affluence and I didn't know anyone in my world like that so it wasn't real to me all I knew was money was this source of trouble right like my parents got divorced we lost the house the car got taken away I would hear their fights it was always about finances right right so um you know for me I got really into sports playing basketball football wrestling and I think for me that was something that that allowed me to see like I can I'm a very high energy energy person. I can like burn my energy off. I can run, I can be free, I can create. Um, but the side of sports that I didn't enjoy was I was the hardest working and we would always lose. And so I started getting into individual sports and I actually got into bodybuilding competitively. So I started working out with weights and doing nutrition. And that was my first experience of seeing if I do all the right things for myself, I'm going to get a result regardless. Nobody can take that away from me. It's not like right. the team thing where because of someone else's lack of work, I'm not going to see a result. It wasn't like my parents were because of what they were doing. I was going to experience the negative effect. It was like, if I do something good, I'm going to experience a positive effect. If I do something that's not so good, I'm going to experience the negative effect of that. So I really dove deep on that. Like I would come home from school and watch YouTube videos of how to, how to train harder in the gym. I learned how to do my dieting. I got myself down to probably 6% body fat at the age of 17 and won 2010 Mr. Anchorage. Um, like just kind of bootstrapping it. So I really, through that, I figured out I'm an obsessive personality. Like when I do something, I, I go deep on it. I'm not mm -hmm. able to like, there's no moderate with me. It's like either I'm in or I'm out, right? Mm -hmm. If it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Um, and so I was doing that. I became a personal trainer and I had no interest in finance. And I had a mentor of mine that he was in finance and he was trying to recruit me. And he's like, Hey, you need to come check this out. And I blew him off. I blew him off. I blew him off. But at the gym, I experienced in the workplace, the same thing I experienced when I was in group sports, I worked my hardest, I actually closed the biggest personal training package that the gym had. I put a lot of time into it and it was like a $4,000 package and I was paid a $30 commission. And I, and I felt robbed. I felt like, you know, I like when the gym, if I just did all this working out and then I got like no result, like that's right. not okay. That's not how that would happen. So right. I, I was willing to then go look at the financial side of the world and learn about that business. And I saw in that presentation, I saw the solutions to the problems that I faced when I was a kid with my family. Like I saw if my mom and dad would have known this, we would have kept the house. We wouldn't, they wouldn't have got divorced. They would have kept their car. We wouldn't have been homeless. I wouldn't have been eating bugs in my cereal. Right. Um, and, and for me, that was just like seeing a solution and then knowing that like it felt like an ethical obligation. I need to help. Right. Seeing how many other Americans are going through this, even the entrepreneurial audience. Being an entrepreneur does not mean you're naturally wealthy. A lot of times That's for sure. you know, it means the opposite. We're struggling. We're trying to make ends meet. You know, yeah. we've got a, a 90 hour a week job that pays us less than a salary initially. On paper, it looks crazy to do, but we're like, cool, I'm going to go do that, right? right? So that that <laughs> really sickness. is what got me into the business world at that age is I, I, was, I was almost unemployable because of my experience with bodybuilding. I was like, I don't want other people controlling my outcome. I have to be in, in charge of that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then, <clears throat> um, crap, I just had a whole huge thing. Do you think now that there's any, did you experience when you started to actually make money, any sort of imposter syndrome or any sort of like, I don't know, adverse effects because of, because of what you'd lived through as a child? Yeah. Um, and, and I have to say it was probably less, less significant than it would have been, um, because of people like you, like I, I had my pizza job and I had podcasts and I would listen to podcasts and books. I remember, you know, listening to John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneur on Fire, literally when he was first getting started, 
And he had an entire episode on imposter syndrome. So before I had even experienced that because of a podcast, I knew what it was. I knew that it was going to be coming down the road shortly. And I kind of knew what to do when it got there because of his experience and what he had shared. So, you know, my, my personal experience was at the pizza job, you know, I was making like 30 K a year. Right. And so my That's first, it was pizza more job, right? He must've worked hard. I hustled. I hustled. Yeah. <laughs> right? I bought the, so I, I mean, you would appreciate this, Christina. So the pizza delivery, I got paid hourly. Right. And then I got paid a delivery fee and then I got tips. And so what I did is I bought a 1999 Geo Metro, which got like 85 miles to the gallon. Uh, super sketchy though. It was like tiny. It's like a Hot Wheels car. It's tiny plastic car. I'm also delivering in Alaska in the winter with rear wheel drive tires, which is oh just God. super sketchy. But I would spend like 10 bucks a night on gas and that was it. So then the other thing I would do is I figured out that, okay, well, if I can pack more orders into my car, I can get more delivery fees. So I'd plan my routes out. I'd be like, okay, well, if all of these are going this way, I'm going to take four orders. There's my delivery fees. And then I figured out if I serviced people, I could actually get more tips. I would call them when I got the pizza in my car and said, hey, this is Jerry with Sicily's. I've got your order right now. I want you to let you, let you know I'm your delivery driver. I'm on my way. It's going to be there in so many minutes. Delivery drivers never do that, right? right? Then I would get there and I would, you know, I would service them at the door. I would ask if your order was correct. And then I would actually close them on the tip. I'd hold the receipt out, just like if I'm selling on a contract, I'd say, fill this out. And I was like, if you feel like I did a good job, you can write the tip right there. And I need your signature. And I give them the pen and hold the receipt. So they would, they were writing it while I was looking at what they were writing. And I would increase my tips that way too. Um, so I would clear sometimes $200 a night between delivery fees and tips and stuff. In addition wow. to my hourly. <laughs> yeah. So I did that for several years. I got up to about 30 K and that was my problem was in the business. Like I grew up on so little that I thought 30 K was a lot. Right. And so I was like, man, if I could just make enough money to replace my pizza income, life would be great. Right. And it's just classically thinking too small. And when I did that, the next one was, I knew that my dad never made more than 50 grand in a year. And so I was like, if I could just make 50 grand, that would be great. And then I did that and I experienced this thing. Cause I didn't know what number to give myself next. So I felt <laughs> like I was floundering. I was like, six figures, maybe like, like, what's the next, so I gave myself that target and I hit 250. And then I finally caught on, like I've hit every single target I've set. I need to set a bigger target. So then I was like, cool. Well, I went to 250. Let me double it. So it was really like the small thinking and the limiting beliefs from my upbringing where I thought, you know, 30 grand was a lot of money. And I thought 50 grand was a lot of money. And, and I saw obviously the evidence of me exceeding those targets, but it wasn't until several years later where I realized the solution, if I would have had a different viewpoint. And that viewpoint was being an entrepreneur for me from a financial standpoint. And I got this from Andrew Carnegie, um, who, who donated his entire net worth, all of his wealth, he gave it away to charity, amazing guy. Uh, and I realized that, that if I have the means to create wealth, it's not just for me, it's to help those that don't have that. Yeah. And when I realized that I realized setting a target just based on what I want is actually selfish. Like if I can do more, I should, I should be contributing. I should be helping out. I should be donating to my church. I should be improving the community. And when I changed to that mindset, then it became a game of how much can I do? How big can I make the number? And it wasn't even because I wanted it. It was because these people need it. I can help. I'm a resource and I owe it to society and I want to be that kind of person. So that really helped me kind of overcome that instantly was just making it about more than just myself, because it really is that introverted self-focus of I'm not good enough, or I only need this, or I don't need that. And it's like, well, what if it wasn't about you? Then the conversation about what's wrong with me goes away because it's not about me anymore. Yeah. It's true because, well, in scarcity mindset keeps us egocentric, right? If you think mm -hmm. I, I've just got to get enough so that I can eat and so that I, you know, can have bug free cereal and so that, right, I don't need to sleep in a tent. And then, and also I think when you start, if you, if your first goal, instead of being 30,000, if it was a million, you would have thought to yourself, well, that's a ridiculous goal. I'm never going to meet that. Right. And you might end up at 10,000 because you just, I think it has to always be the next logical step for you kind of mentally, right? Otherwise, I think so. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I, and I think it should be like a stiff, like just real, but it's also going to make me stretch. Yeah. Right. And, and so everyone's, I think it's very subjective. Everyone's definition of what that's going to look like for them is a bit different, but I think it's very helpful to have other, you know, viewpoints and, and, you know, mentors and coaches and, and even just 
you know, mentors from afar, people that listen to your podcast and they hear, we're saying, Hey, you should set your target a little higher. And they're mm-hmm. like, okay, I can do that. Let me try that. And it might actually pull them further than they would have. Yeah, absolutely. So Jerry, what do you think? Was there something that you can point to and you say, wow, when I heard this, this kind of changed things or a pivotal sort of moment in your life when you just said, right, okay, I'm putting a stake in the ground here. I'm changing my trajectory, which maybe wasn't that great as a seven-year-old or whatever. Can you think of anything that sort of is, is, was like a, you know, a real boom kind of moment for you? Yeah. So I think of a couple. Um, so my first one, so when I first really started making money in, in the financial world, it was probably, um, it was in 2015. And that's when I started getting into like the 30,000, 50,000 kind of range where I could quit the pizza job and just do this full time. And so, um, I was working, you're probably familiar with Dave Ramsey. He's like an online, um, yep. financial personality. So I was an endorsed investing provider for him in, in several States. And so there would be leads that were listening to his show. They'd be interested. And I would actually fly down from Alaska and go meet with them. Wow. And, you know, I was kind of doing this on a shoestring budget. So one of my first trips down, like I didn't like the, my, we had a VW Passat. It broke right before the trip, German car, very expensive to fix. The money that I was going to spend on my trip went to go fix the car so that my ex-wife now at the time she could drive while I was gone. And so I had to put the trip on a credit card. I had enough for a one-way plane ticket, three days in a hotel and two days with a rental car. And so I'm like going there and like, like you're the entrepreneur. You're like, I can't not, I have to, even though it's risky, I, I know I can make it happen. Like you said, the money's going to show up. Yeah. Don't worry about the details. Just put the action in. So I was doing that and I get down there and uh, I had a moment in my room where I was, you know, two days into it. The rental car was overdue. Um, I did not have a plane ticket home. It's February and I'm in Minnesota and my hotel room is expiring tomorrow night and I've made no sales. And I have no idea how I'm going to get home. Like, like I don't have a plane ticket. I've got nothing. I maxed out my only credit card budget rental car is calling me saying, Hey, when you rent a car and don't bring it back, that's called theft. <laughs> like We're going to be, you know, reporting it if you don't bring it back soon. And so um, I sat down and I, I had to really look at the situation I was in. And similar to what I experienced in the last six months or so is I had to take responsibility for it and realize my actions and beliefs created where I'm at. And I'm never going to let this happen again. And I was in this shitty hotel room, like, you know, drug deals happening in the hallways. I'm pretty sure domestic abuse in the room next to me, like just one of those kind of scenes is not a good place. And so I'm sitting there thinking and realizing like, okay, I I have to get into action. Like I, I, this is my do or die moment. And at that moment, you know, that next day I went out, I closed the sale. I got the commissions advanced. I got my plane ticket. And everything turned out fine, but I was this close to literally being homeless in Minnesota. No friends, no nobody, uh, no plane ticket, you know, all of my credit cards maxed out. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of like the level of intensity that I had to personally get to to like step it up. Yeah. Right. And so that was a big realization was that, you know, discomfort and necessity to some degree is the catalyst. And that can be a very powerful catalyst. On the flip side, you don't have to let it get to that point. Like, you know, you can you can predict what's going to happen if I don't close more sales and then be like, before I get to that level, let me handle it ahead of time. Yeah. But it was really for me a decision at that point of like, I'm never going to let this happen again. Um, so that was a big one. And I would say in the last six months, another big one was just, you know, with experiencing everything I experienced, um, you know, not not allowing myself to have, you know, the wrong people around me in my business was a big realization. Yeah. Right. And it and it doesn't like we kind of went over this a bit, but it doesn't mean that there are bad people and they're negative and they're they're, you know, tearing you apart and being covert about it. Sometimes it just means you don't have the star players yet. You don't have the people you should have and the people you do have aren't bad, but they're just not it. Right. And, you know, that that is kind of like, you know, pulling in the right talent and the right people and kind of being unreasonable with, you know, this is who I want and need. And I'm going to make sure that that happens and in a business similar to marketing for your ideal client right? Like you get to a point where you can't keep selling to just everyone. You, you need to sell to who your ideal client is. Right. And that means you do need to say no to everyone that you could make it work for, but they're not the perfect client for you. Exactly. Um, and that goes for talent, partnerships, vendors as well. Yep. The 80, 20 rule, just pervasive in life. <laughs> right. Yeah. So those, those are probably two of my bigger ones, you know, more recent. And then that, that moment, you know, kind of at the very beginning of, of being in the hotel room like that. Yeah. That's, 
sucky situation. I have a similar thing when I was, when I left my ex-husband, just being in a hotel room and, you know, same thing, like I slept in the car or whatever, but I was just, I knew that it was the beginning of a really great thing. It was just in a really crappy situation right that minute, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. So Jerry, I can't believe how fast this time has gone by. Um, just, is there anything that you wish I would have asked you? I mean, I think we could probably talk for another two or three hours, but yeah. <laughs> that would be like a, you know, let's see how long we can make a podcast. Um, is there anything you wish that I would have touched on anything that you want to really make sure that people know before we sort of, before I, you give them your contact details and stuff? Yeah, no, I think we covered a lot. And I think, you know, um, you know, kind of to go back to the title of my book of, of the man in the arena, I got that, you know, inspiration from a speech from Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt, you know, his speech, he talks about how, you know, life really is for and it's about the guy that's in the arena, the woman that's in the arena. Uh, and being in the arena means that you're, you're putting your best effort out, you're, you're, you're spending yourself on a worthy purpose, you're, you have, you know, there's the blood, sweat, and tears aspect of it, the barriers, the failures. And then he also talks about the critic, right? The the armchair cowboy with his pants unzipped and the Lay's potato chips and the, the speaker talking about how the professional athlete should be performing better, right? Like there's always going to be that. And so that's kind of the message that I want to drive home is be the person in the arena, right? Like really give it your all. And if you fail, you're, you're stronger as a result and you learn and, you know, chances are you're not going to, I've found when I really give my best, generally, I actually achieve the goals that I want to. And, you know, on the critic side of that is like, don't listen to them and also don't be one, right? If you're the arena, you don't have time to be a critic. You're putting all your energy towards your goals. Right. Um, and if you're really busy, you don't even have time to listen to the ones that, that do speak up. Right. Exactly. And if you do fail, you it's just one more step, right? You learned something that you're going to need to get to that next level. So it's not, it's never hopeless. It's just, you know, like, um, you know, Tony Robbins says, what if everything is happening for you, not to you? Right. Mm -hmm. and, that, and it is. So deal with it. So, <laughs> <I love that. laughs> Jerry, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Because I know they're going to so want to after hearing everything you've shared. A couple ways you can go on on uh, Instagram at Jerry Feta, um, J E R R Y. My last name is like the cheese, but with two T's in it. It's F E T T A. Um, just find me there. We're also on TikTok. We do a lot of content. Um, if you're listening, you can also grab a copy of my book that I just released. Um, I kind of told the story about the fraud. So 100% of the proceeds are going to create awareness um, and, and education about financial fraud. It's actually a $10 billion per year problem in the United States. Um, the FBI reports that it increased by about 183% year over year from last year to this year. So, you know, for me, that's a, it's now a personal passion project. I, it was the adverse effect of it. And it's one of those things that's very unfair because I can do all the right things. I make all the right decisions. And because of someone else's unethical conduct, it can cost me a lot. So um, we're taking all the proceeds to create awareness for that. And also to make whole the families that were impacted by it. So um, you know, we can drop the link maybe in the chat or in the, uh, the, the description. Um, but if you go to jerryfeta.com forward slash the man in the arena, um, you can grab a copy of the book there too. Excellent. And I'll make sure that that's in the show notes as well. I think we might maybe should update those from when we originally talked because I think some of the links have changed. I don't think you had that book out then because the one I read is a different book. Right. Yeah. You probably read blueprints of financial freedom. Yes. That's the one. Yes. And that's, that's another great one too. That's, that's, um, doing my rebuild, that's the blueprint I'm following. You know, this is exactly what we teach our clients and I'm just following my own recipe now. Excellent. Excellent. Jerry, thank you so much for being with us today. I love talking with you. I love your energy. You're awesome. And, uh, you know, get the right attitude. You're definitely going to be miles ahead of the competition, miles ahead of where most people are at your age or at any age for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Christine. It's been a blast and I hope this is valuable for your audience. Oh, I know it is. And that's a nice, that's a good segue to tell the audience. If you're listening, you need to share Jerry's message with everybody, you know, or at least think of one person right now who you could forward this to and share this with, because they will thank you. And I'm going to thank you, Jerry, and have a My fantastic pleasure. week. You too. Thanks, Christine. Thank you.